Hey there. We are closing up one more video after this, uh, Burnout Society. And this was a really beautiful chapter. Uh, it's called The Society of Tiredness. And we've talked a lot about, like, sad and uncomfortable things. But Han is turning his attention to a better type of tiredness. And he moves through a few different iterations it can take in line with the casting a slow gaze episode that we did, which you can never predict this. YouTube tagged that with something. I don't know what it was, but um, it didn't show up for a lot of people. And I even had people emailing me wondering why I skipped an episode because it just didn't, it wasn't in their feeds. I don't know why. I don't know what phrase was in there that that was worrisome for them. It was one of the nicer episodes, I think, on Han. Um, but we're gonna be returning to that a bit today, right? When he talks about Cezanne, the impressionist painter, right? who would look out over the landscape and breathe, and his pleasant, leisurely type of tiredness would watch the world until slow forms emerged that normally we couldn't even see because we're frenetic and moving and always on to the next thing. And he would do that so long that he could kind of visualize the aroma coming up off of the tulips and how these warring currents of wind would swirl the aroma around and push it over mountains and over into the ocean and over into, right? Would it hug the ground? Would it spiral up? And um, then he'd paint. And in these impressionistic paintings, you'll see that movement of painters picking up on, on, on things that aren't always obvious to us, right? And you get that slow gaze, I think, in the American Transcendentalists, too, when you hear Emerson um, I think he was quoting Coleridge when he said this. You know, one walks around and sees steeples peeking over, over rooftops, and they can't help but feel like this is religion calcified, right? It's as though uh, whatever truth lies within these great analogies for life and what it can feel like, as though they hardened the idea circled so long that it had to become a material reality, and we get the Gothic cathedral, right? where we get steeples in a small town. These poetic kind of literary insights that really enrich the world don't really appear to us if we're in that hyperactive mindset that, remember, Han says is we pride ourselves on it, right? We're kind of like, oh, I can do so, so many plates spinning and I'm still showing up and doing all of my work and taking care of my home stuff and my work stuff and boy, there's just so much going on. And he says, why is that impressive? Do you know what's hyperactive? animals when they creep their way over to to the thing that they hunted down and take bites out of it constantly looking over their shoulders seeing what might be coming up behind them never able to just sit in a moment and contemplate and see those longer forms in fact one of the special things it seems about people particularly in societies where they set themselves up stockpile resources they can kind of hang out sometimes it seems to be this long contemplative possibility uh, from which we get great art and culture, great thinking, innovations and new ideas, right? Because it isn't a constant, hyperactive, precarious mode where you're always looking over your shoulder. And he says, in the new hyperactivity and exhaustion of the burnout society, it creates an exhaustion and not a good kind. And in this chapter, we're going to look at a good kind, a good kind of tiredness. So when he says a society of tiredness, he's talking about a future, a possible future in line with capitalist realism, which again, I, I think a big, a big misreading of capitalist realism and to an extent, maybe a miswatching of the series would be the belief that Fisher thinks capitalist realism is like real. It is felt. It's a description of the mood of that epoch, right? It's a description of a type of subjectivity that seems to emerge from late modernity. There's always one. It's nothing special, right? This one's just different. Fisher isn't saying it actually is impossible to imagine a world outside of a very specific mode of production we're currently in. He's saying that's what it feels like. In the same way when we read Good For Nothing on Patreon, his great essay about depression, he says it feels as though he is ontologically inferior. That is what depression feels like. That's the voice you get. And if you want to find the logic of it, you know, that, that he's highlighting that very well in a way a lot of people will feel. As though stamped into each of his atoms is a type of insufficiency, right? It's ontological, he says. It's a powerful phrase, right? 
So in the same way with uh, diagnosing society or an epoch with a kind of with a kind of neurosis, right, a kind of malaise, it's the logic, and it might be an irrational logic. Uh, Han is diagnosing this burnout society, these very specific conditions that make us feel a very certain kind of way, and looking at how all of these things has changed since other articulators have talked about it, but is not eternity, is not forever, is not this thing will never leave. And in this chapter, we kind of see where Han would like things to move and where he thinks they could move. Things we can feel in our personal lives, little pockets, little pockets of resistance that are enriching and nourishing in a way that, that this other system that he's outlined so far can't account for and doesn't really make possible. And it's worth pointing out that when he describes the burnout society, I think some people can feel like he's getting a little bit too specific. And when you're too precious with your language and you tease things apart that carefully and are that definite with your claims, there's suspicion that arises. And one of the important things to make clear, both with Fisher and with Han, um, he isn't saying that all of us carry within us this perfect little micro burnout society or little micro capitalist realism, or rather it's in the air. It's kind of the mood we're in. And if we reason up from the structures that kind of, that kind of give rise to that, then suddenly we see that these knee-jerk reactions and this knee-jerk kind of common sense way of thinking and these knee-jerk justifications for things are patterned. And suddenly we find like the fount of, right? And a through line that predicts them. It's like a, you have a bunch of these just kind of random numbers that keep appearing. And then suddenly you find the formula that consistently generates them and they're not random. That's kind of the goal of this type of thinking and this type of project. What is the implied logic that can result in a lot of the behaviors and ways of thinking and types of culture that are the consequences of that? And it's, the way of, it's a way of thinking we're incredibly comfortable doing behind us for other moments in time, but remarkably uncomfortable doing right now. So far in the book, Han has been describing tiredness, but of a very specific kind, right? It's been uh, divisive and private. He calls it a solitary tiredness, right? One that kind of shuts you into yourself, but doesn't really open you up to the world or to others. Uh, it's one that makes less articulable what you're going through. So it's solitary tiredness, as opposed to like, Han doesn't say this, but like a, a tiredness of solidarity where everybody kind of in unison understands. They hit that universalizing layer. Or one of the essayists that Han is interested in in this chapter calls an eloquent seeing and reconciliatory tiredness to this speechlessness, sightlessness, and divisive tiredness. The solitary tiredness he's talking about shifts that center of gravity inward, and it's, it pulls you into a kind of a solipsism, right? A void outside and then just you. This other trusting tiredness leans out into the world instead, right, where it can find others. It's one, he says, that trusts in the world, that makes room for it, rather than shuts it all out, right? So he would ask, why are we prone to the solitary tiredness, and much less to the trusting tiredness? We've talked plenty in the past two reading series about atomization and responsabilization. There's a lot of overlap here with Fisher's kind of cultural analysis and David Harvey's economic analysis and then Byung Chul Han without rigor necessarily. Well, with rigor, but only rigor within impressionistic kind of paint strokes. He isn't doing a photorealistic, here is my grand theory. He's doing a series of chapters that kind of are blots that when you move far enough away, approximate a larger framework. But he doesn't seem interested in really giving it to you perfectly. Um, and instead, it's kind of letting it unfold itself over a series of a bunch of really short texts that he puts out. So it's less I and more world, he says. It's a trusting tiredness that has, it has the slow gaze, right? It is an exhaustion and an inability to do something anymore, but a possibility to not do anything. Kind of a serene not doing, he says. At which point he gives it another name, fundamental tiredness, much like his Cezanne story, which gives us, quote, access to long and slow forms that elude short and fast hyperattention. 
All forms are slow. Each form is a detour. The economy of efficiency and acceleration makes them disappear. But suddenly in this uh, trusting tiredness, this fundamental tiredness, the, the essayist he likes here says, we feel a, a loosening of the strictures of identity. Suddenly, things flicker and twinkle and vibrate at the edges. They grow less determinate and more porous and lose some of their resolution. Right? They take on an aura of friendliness, which makes it possible to conceive of a community that requires neither belonging nor relation. Human beings and things show themselves to be connected through a friendly hand. Right? A community of singularities prefigured in a Dutch still life. Right? Oh, that's such a powerful image. So there, there are bees and beetles and flowers and, and fruit and snails all over the still image. None of them may know that the others is there from you looking at the painting. They're all brought into one thing. That's the, the and, he says, right? At least at the end of my gaze, all of these things are brought in to a broader thing. And it, it would imply that I am too, for somebody else perceiving me. You see how the shift in the position can shift this types of, these types of tiredness, right? When you finally can blip into that slower gaze he's talking about and not feel that rushing, suddenly these things become clear. They just kind of emerge as slower patterns that weren't nearly as obvious before. And there's this subtle connectivity between all these things. And it becomes clear that if you can see that and have that moment of seeing that and, rather than that solitary tiredness that shuts out the entire world in a little bubble of solipsism, right? But the one that leans into the world, that trusts in it, that knows it cannot fall out of it, right? And suddenly we get a new name for it again, right? He calls it the we tiredness. He or the essayist he's quoting. Right, so rather than the I tiredness, right, the exhausted ego that is so exhausted as to shut out the world to protect itself, it, it's no longer a I am tired of this, right? It's no longer a I am tired of you. It becomes we're tired, right? I'm tired with you. We have in us a common tiredness. And, and, and suddenly, what could have been an isolating solipsistic tiredness, kind of a sour, bitter, solipsistic individual one, becomes almost rejuvenating, right? And, and communal. It's a Sabbath, the moment of stopping, right? The seventh day is the one that's holy, the one where there is rest, the interruption, which you remember, this is why he doesn't like a simmering anger and likes an idea of a momentary bit of rage, which shakes the familiarity and the inertia out of a situation and interrupts it. It puts up a break in it or otherwise it'd be just like a slow festering that doesn't really end. It just goes on and goes on and goes on. So suddenly this tiredness of solidarity, trusting tiredness, fundamental tiredness, we tiredness, it opens up an interval at a time where a definite interval is hard to feel. We talked a lot in the Fisher series about the move from Fordism to post-Fordism where things actually end, clock in, clock out, done. But then if you have real post-Fordist work like me freelancing, right? Or maybe you do gig economy and work remote at a normal job and are like straddling all these worlds. There is something about not being able to clock in or clock out definitively. That means you're just always in both worlds and there's never just a moment of pure rest. Everything becomes an opportunity cost, right? And that cloud is the ability to just fully be in this deep tiredness he's talking about, this fundamental tiredness. Suddenly, an interval opens up, and what has become a procession of blurring together of all things. And it becomes possible to have that long, slow gaze where you can even imagine, if you wanted to, that playful how the fragrance is floating over other things. Which I know it can count, it can sound quaint or a bit silly until you have one of those moments and you realize what it isn't. It isn't like a little feel-good moment. It's a really profound moment that'll give you a deep appreciation for like just some of the best stuff we have, right? Suddenly it becomes clear to you how that was made and you're not left wondering, how did somebody write Moby Dick? It's like, oh wow, someone felt this before and they knew what to do with it. Uh, and, and, and Melville ceases to be like a, a distant neurotic who felt too much for the world. Emerson ceases to be a distant neurotic who felt too much. And it's just like, oh, they were 
observers of this, and I'm like in that solitary tiredness, right? Where everything kind of becomes an enemy. Every noise is a pestering knocking on your head, right? Being around other people is the potentiality for things to go wrong or, or something like that. Instead, in this little interval, in this slow gaze, you find that the way you're looking at things kind of disarms the world before it can assault the serenity you're in. Like you looking at the individual things in the still life and bringing them all into one thing, not just seeing a fly or a snail, which might not be very nice, but seeing them on this still life might be very nice, right? You can just start disarming things, seeing the mediations that are wrapped up in. In other words, nothing really shaking you out of this very pleasant tiredness. So Han concludes, if we need some image of a better future, like this is the achievement society, the burnout society, this is the type of exhaustion and tiredness we're dealing with. If we need some image of what could be possible now that we know that this is, this is an interesting angle, a society of tiredness, of this type of fundamental we tiredness, he's saying, right? One that finds in the world a community that needs no kinship. The essay says, a certain tired man can be seen as a new Orpheus. The wildest beasts gather around him and are at last able to join in his tiredness. Tiredness gives the dispersed individuals the keynote, right? The theme that prevails in the scene. It dissolves the solitary eye out and leans and trust into the world and then lets the keynote exist in the things around. And they report back into you assimilating it. And it's a trusting in, not an exhausting, solitary, solipsistic eye tiredness, right? It can be a little bit abstract at first. The first time I engaged, encountered anything like this, it was reading Emerson, the guy I talk about too much. Um, but I, I've, I've been seeing a bunch of people take on that same similar feeling and explain it from a million different directions. And this is yet another one, um, which is really interesting. So, okay, hopefully that wasn't too abstract. Hopefully some of that landed, and I don't doubt revisiting it will flesh more and more of it out. But we are moving on to our final episode next, so bye.